Good morning. I'm Annie Madonia, the Chief Advancement Officer at the LenFest Institute, and it's wonderful to welcome everyone to the inaugural LenFest News Philanthropy Summit, which I believe is the largest gathering for fundraising professionals in local news. It's a program of the LenFest News Philanthropy Network, which provides webinars, deep dive training, and sharing of best practices for more than a thousand members from nonprofit, for profit, digital, print, legacy, and startup news organizations across the country and around the world. More than 730 people are with us for this three day conference from across the United States and our neighbor Canada to South Africa, the UK, Jordan, Israel, the Netherlands, India, Australia, the Czech Republic, and Brazil. Clearly news philanthropy is a critical and growing revenue stream across our industry and the News Philanthropy Network and this summit is dedicated to helping those of us driving this work. Philanthropy has for generations funded our local schools, hospitals, museums, and social service programs, and local news is just as important as those critical community assets. And I don't think it's too outrageous to say that one day we'll look at what we've accomplished as fundraisers and see that we have been at the beginning of a really important movement dedicated to ensuring our very democracy, because no money, no mission, and we're at the center of that. Over the next three days, we'll meet philanthropists and learn about how they think about local news and why they do what they do. We'll hear from experts in the field who will share national trends, lead workshops, and teach us about some of the best practices, their success stories, and their challenges. We'll learn about broadening our definition of what a donor is and what motivates them. We'll talk about engaging community in our work. We'll hear about why development professionals are actually agents of change and should be at the center of our organizations and their work. And we'll have a chance to engage in small community chats on various topics where we can really let our hair down and lean on and learn from each other. We hope you leave the summit feeling inspired by your work and by the tremendous network of amazing people in our field. Our work as fundraisers is valuable and important and we're all in it together. So if you're not a member of the News Philanthropy Network, we hope you will join, it's free and participate in our year round schedule of programs. And please give us your feedback, both on the summit and the network, we're here for you and we design our programs for you. Before we get started with our opening session, I'd just like to say a few thank yous, so please bear with me. Since our launch five years ago, donors and partners throughout Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and across the country have contributed $85 million to the Institute. We've grown from about 25 donors five years ago to 2,300 annual donors who have made 9,000 gifts so far this year alone. So first and foremost, thank you to those donors who've made our work possible and through their generosity are helping to ensure that local news remains as vital as ever. Everyone at the Institute has played a part in that, from the operations team that run our programs, to the finance team that manage the money, to the advancement team focused on fundraising and communications. Everyone, directly or indirectly, plays a key part in inspiring donors to give. First, I'd like to thank our board, led by David Boardman, our chair, and Roz Reamer, our vice chair, who support all of our efforts and provide critical leadership and counsel to all of our work. The LenFest Institute's executive director, Jim Friedlich, is an amazing partner. He has helped to lead our fundraising from the earliest days of the Institute and engaged our very first donors. He has supported and championed the network and this summit from the very beginning and is himself a joy to work with on fundraising. <clears throat> Rebecca Foreman, our director of advancement, who if you don't know, you'll meet over the course of these couple of days, is also a joy to work with and has done so much to drive our fundraising forward. She's the consummate development professional and spends every day making sure our community of donors are giving, engaged, and supportive. Kira Miller, our advancement associate, oversees our gift processing, checking every detail, and making sure that we are thanking and stewarding every single of the 9,000 donors. Thank you. And of course, I'd like to thank Yossi Lichterman, our communication and editorial director, who you all know or have gotten emails from, who leads the day-to-day -day work of the News Philanthropy Network in this summit, among many other things, and is completely unflappable. None of this would have been possible without him, his leadership, and his steady hand. He's joined by Haley Slusser, who's worked tirelessly behind the scenes to promote the summit, and the LenFest staff who are with us hosting Zoom rooms and helping make sure all goes well. And a special thanks also to Will Logger, a freelance journalist in Minneapolis, who with his skills combining data, 
visual storytelling and audience engagement has helped to design and produce the summit. Thank you all. And thank you especially to the many people who stepped up to share their work with all of us this week. We will all be better off for having learned from you. This includes the three amazing women on this panel with me who've played such an important part in all of this. Sharon Chan, Fraser Nelson, and Terry Quinn. And I wanna share a thought with you that I had today from uh, today. Terry trip. Quinn and I met at a Knight Foundation conference pre-COVID and as we stood online at the Miami airport to go home, we agreed to be in touch to talk about how we might build our network and help drive philanthropy for local news. A few months later in 2019, we hosted a small gathering of fundraisers at LendFest offices here in Philadelphia to share programs and ideas and best practices. There were about 30 of us at that, and the feedback we got was that it was really great to have a network of fundraisers all in the same room together and we should try to keep the group going. The four of us got to know each other a little better at that event, and together we hosted our next gathering, a small dinner in Miami in February of 2020, and then the pandemic hit. So we pivoted from occasional in-person convenings to regular virtual gatherings, and the year-round network was born. These women are great fundraisers and remarkable people. We all came to fundraising for local news differently, so today we'll talk about how we got here, why we do what we do, and the lessons we've learned along the way. So let me introduce these remarkable ladies. Sharon Chan is at the New York Times, where she started in 2019 as their VP of Philanthropy and was recently named Deputy for Newsroom Culture and Careers. Before that, she spent 13 years at the Seattle Times, working across the company and ultimately leading their fundraising efforts, serving as the VP, VP of Innovation and Product Development. Frazier Nelson is the co-founder and managing director of the National Trust for Local News. Before that, she served as the VP of Business Innovation at Salt Lake Tribune. And before that, she led initiatives in social justice and innovation and served as the founder and executive director of the Utah Community Foundation. Terry Quinn is the chief development officer at the Texas Tribune, where she's been since 2014. Before joining the Tribune, she raised money across the entire nonprofit sector, sector excuse me, spending five years at the Nature Conservancy, where she led their fundraising efforts across Central Texas. She's also led fundraising efforts in education, the arts, and healthcare. I've been in fundraising for my entire career, first in the performing arts at Lincoln Center and Carnegie Hall in New York, and then at the Cleveland Orchestra and Philadelphia Orchestra. I then moved to social services, leading the fundraising program for Philadelphia's United Way, and joined the LendFest team as its chief advancement officer and its fourth employee in 2017. So let's get started. Please feel free to throw questions in the chat. We'll try to keep on top of them, and we'll leave plenty of time at the end for live Q&A as well. And please, if you're enjoying yourself, tweet about the summit with the hashtag NewsFill Summit. So Sharon, can we start with you? Why did you transition? Hey, why did you transition from journalism into fundraising? I mean, what about the role attracted you as a journalist? And what have you had to think about or deal with as you made that transition from news to fundraising? Um, yeah, well, first of all, just thank you to LendFest Institute for bringing us all together and creating this amazing learning and networking and support opportunity. Um, I've been so impressed by LendFest leadership in building this field up. Um, and I also want to add that I'm starting a new job, but I'm not running away from fundraising. I actually think my new job is harder than fundraising and staying in that job at the New York Times. And we are hiring for that position. So get in touch if you want to talk about that. <laughs> How did I become a fundraiser? Um, I had a very inauspicious beginning as a door-to-door -door fundraiser at seven years old for the MS Society, in which I ended up crying on the curb because I didn't understand how to make change. Um, <laughs> but actually, my, well. <laughs> yeah, like I, someone wanted to give me 20 and take like $10 out of like 10 $1 bills out of my basket. And I started crying because I thought <laughs> I left with less money, um, which is just a lesson is when you're starting out fundraising, you don't know what success is going to look like. I, um, from then on, uh, actually I've been fundraising since 2003 as a volunteer. So my first work in fundraising was as for a scholarship in Seattle called the Northwest Journals of Color Scholarship. And this is a scholarship that was 20 years old when I started working on it. Every year we raised $5,000 from all the news organizations in town. And I thought, why don't we ask individuals 
to give to this scholarship because actually journalists in our community don't have a place to give to support journalism. And over time, over the next four years, we ended up building a hundred thousand dollar endowment for that scholarship. And in that process, you know, like I had to go, you know, each year I was probably asking a hundred people to give um, anywhere from $50 to a hundred dollars. And um, I felt like maybe 85% said yes. So I just realized from that experience that asking for money is not that hard, especially when you really believe in what you're fundraising for. So it became a full-time actually paying job in 2014. I was the op-ed editor at the Seattle Times and Frank Blethin, the publisher had managed to launch our first initiative, the Education Lab. And he wanted to bring on someone to spend a year trying to renew funding for that and to build new labs, which led to Traffic Lab, Project Homeless, and our investigative journalism fund. Um, I will say that, and then I did that over many years and then joined the Times in 2019. I will say when you move from journalism to um, fundraising, the biggest challenge you have is just the imposter syndrome. Um, I obviously don't have, I did not have professional, I mean, my experience was asking for $100 checks, right? I had not raised money for the Nature Conservancy or built a community foundation in Utah or worked at Lincoln Center um, in doing multi-million dollar campaigns. But I think the important thing to remember if you are in that position of a journalism turned fundraiser, that you have actually been chosen for this role because the newsroom trusts you. At the Seattle Times, they had actually previously tried to get the head of marketing and the head of public relations to do this work. They had excellent relationships in the community. They knew everyone, but the newsroom did not trust them to develop initiatives that represented the independent journalism that they wanted to do. So if you're in this spot, you're a journalist turned fundraiser, you're there, you are the chosen person because the newsroom trusts you. Terry, what about, Sharon talked about those of us who've come to fundraising from outside the journalism field. What about you? What about your roles at other nonprofits prepared you for fundraising for journalism? Why, and why the switch? And are the principles the same or very different? Um, well, you know, first of all, I've worked at the Tribune longer than I've worked in any other nonprofit. So uh, there's something about it that has um, really appealed to me. And I think it's because it's sort of the culmination of all the other fields that I've worked in previously. We cover the environment, that we cover healthcare, we cover education, all these traditional types of, of nonprofit orgs where I've worked previously, um, they're all encapsulated in our coverage. And so I think that I get to feed my personal interests as well as my professional interests. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I actually have found that the basics are the same, you know, that I'm having similar conversations because it's all about mission. And so whether it's the mission at the Nature Conservancy or the mission of the Tribune, that's what motivates people and that's um, what motivates me every day. Um, and so really I've seen the parallels um, all the way through. I think, especially earlier on, but still today, um, you know, having to explain the, the case for philanthropy for journalism has probably been, um, takes up more of my time than it would have at a traditional nonprofit org, but, um, every day, it feels like we're getting closer to people understanding that automatically um, and the, the, the uh, amount of explaining that I have to do or um, convincing seems uh, less and less uh, each year. And so, you know, I just find it very um, empowering to be a part of, of something like this, you know, um, not only that was uh, a startup that we're trying to bring, you know, uh, to greater and greater sustainability. Actually, today is the 12th anniversary of the Texas Tribune. So that's oh, kind of an exciting milestone. And uh, so, you know. I think it's, um, it, and I think that milestone, I say it because it's not just about us, it's about all of us on this call, right, um, that, that we've been able to map out this path for sustainability bodes well for all of us, and, but we're not done yet, you know, um, um, we're ambitious and thinking about what else we can be doing, and um, there's something about that that I just find um, thrilling 
uh, to be on the cusp of, of this new form of philanthropy and at this org that is bringing not only so much um, to Texas, but I hope to the whole news ecosystem is just, um, you know, this work, uh, we're gonna talk about this later, this work can be exhausting, but, <laughs> Um, but if you focus on the mission and, you know, and, and remind ourselves, I just watched a video that sort of recaps our 12 years and I got a little emotional, you know, and we have to remind ourselves of all the good. It's, it's amazing um, that it's been 12 years since the Texas Tribune was launched. And I really feel, I said it earlier, I really feel like we're on the cusp of having launched a whole new movement for fundraising and philanthropy for, for, for local news. And I think that's what excites me. It sounds like it does you all as well. And Frazier, I'm, I'm, I'm sure for you too. So, um, but it, um, knowing that um, the community is stepping up and supporting a, something that they love and believe in and understand the importance of, but in new ways and ways they have never done before. I mean, building this from scratch is really empowering, whether you're building a news organization from scratch or a development program from scratch. It's, it's, it's really, really exciting. Um, and I think we should all, all of us in the room should be patting ourselves on the back for however much or however little we've done and accomplished so far, uh, moving, moving this big ball forward. But let's talk about lessons learned a little bit, Frazier. <laughs> you, you've talked, and Terry alluded to this a little bit, you've talked about needing to be able to deal with rejection and the job and not take it personally when a donor says no. I think being a fundraiser takes stamina for sure because you can get a million dollar gift or a $10 gift, whatever your big gift is in the morning and in the afternoon a donor calls and is cranky about something and you feel completely deflated. deflated. So it takes a lot of stamina. T talk about that a little bit, needing to deal with rejection and, and not taking it personally. Well, it's hard. <laughs> uh, my dad was a salesman and I think watching him growing up um, and how hard he worked to to make a sale and he always said just because they don't you know buy it from me today doesn't mean they won't buy it from me tomorrow and I really saw that in action in his life and I think one of the things that um he taught me and that I think we teach each other is that no just means not right now. I mean, unless someone says like, I never want to hear from you again and is very, very specific about the need to sever whatever relationship you're trying to create, it's just a, it's just a question of timing. And a no and, a, and isn't really necessarily a rejection. You don't know what's going on in that person's life. You don't know what, especially in this day and age, right? We don't know what is happening to them financially or what's happening to them in their family life. And it just might be the right time, not might be the right time. So I think that a no is really a time to deepen the relationship and the understanding that they have about what you're trying to achieve. You know, we always hear in the world of fundraising, lead with asking for advice, ask for advice, and then you'll get money. So if you hear a no, sometimes it's an opportunity to ask people what they're thinking, what advice they have for you, where they think that the, you know, the, the fill in the blank organization could do a better job, et cetera. But it is important to listen at that time. And it's also important to, you know, buck up. I don't like getting rejected. I get rejected. If we'd all been counted the times we'd be rejected, we, you know, I mean, it's like Tinder, right? I mean, I'm swiping left or whatever it is that people do that to me all day long and it's hard. That's why having a, a network of people around you who are going through the same thing and who understand it and can buck each other up. And don't think this is just for new folks. The, the four women you're looking at here, we support each other. As many years as we've been in this business, when I've got a problem, I know I can call. When I'm down, I know I can call. And when I've had a success, I know I have people who will celebrate with me. So find your local society of fundraisers, the nonprofits association in your community might have a group of fundraisers. Find other people in this field in your community that you can call on. And in this conference that we're holding, and thank you, Lenfest, for bringing us together, we're doing this because we want you to build out your own networks. So pay attention to who's here and reach out. Everybody needs 
four or three or six people around them who can be their support group um, for when times times of joy and times of you have such a great um, point, Frazier. The support that we provide each other is really, really is really, really helpful. And one thing I noticed when I first joined the institute and started meeting people who were doing fundraising, and you know, four years ago, five years ago, there there weren't many of us that we knew about anyway. Um, is that we felt a little bit like we were reinventing the wheel for the first time and figuring out how to do this for the first time. And so being able to reach out to your local AFP and other nonprofit associations is so important. There's also a multitude of nonprofit organizations in your in our communities that have development teams, development staff, or one person operation, whatever it is, and getting to know them too, because as you guys have talked about a little bit, the, the principles are, are the same. Um, and what's been interesting to me is we think about sharing best practices across our industry. In our home communities, our donors compare our work at our news organization with the local hospital or school or museum or nature conservancy. And so knowing how they're doing their work is really important to being able to relate to donors in the way they're used to being related to and talked to and connected with. Do you, does that make sense? Do you think that's right? Yeah, and I think, you know, one thing about being connected to all of those is that you don't want to be doing something the same time someone else is doing something. So Terry was just sharing that she's got her gala coming up. And it's really important that we that you know your local fundraising cadence and what's going on and the people there so that if someone's got a major event or there's a capital campaign launching or whatever, you're mindful and respectful of their activities because we really are all in each other's workspace in some respects. And so we wanna make sure that we're good partners with everybody in the field in our communities and not outliers. And since news is sort of new to the game, so to speak, making sure that you are being part of that community of development officers in your state and your region is a really nice way to be respectful and to get the information you need and the support you need. Yeah, I think that's so true. Setting expectations is also really important. Setting expectations for yourself internally to your organization and then externally out in the community that you're, you're reaching out to. I know, Sharon, you've talked a lot about how important that is to our success. And what, is, what does that look like from where you sit? And sort of who are we setting expectations with and, and what kind of expectations? Yeah, I think that's the biggest shift when you go from fundraising as a volunteer to fundraising as a job, right? Now all of a sudden there are goals to meet. Um, I was really lucky in that when I first started doing this job and I was reporting to Frank um, at the Seattle Times, um, the executive, his executive assistant had printed out all the emails he'd ever sent to the Gates Foundation, our first funder, and put them in a binder and she just handed them to, it was actually two giant two inch binders. And I could see from looking through there that it had taken him two years, right, from that first email to the launch of Education Lab. And I think like, and you know, I feel like that 18 to 24 months to really see something significant is like, it takes that long. Like I like, I would like to think like now that I've been doing it for a couple of years or I have great brand recognition with the New York Times that it might move faster, but it won't. Mm -hmm. And um, that is, doesn't mean you're not working that whole time, but that was like a really important part of like when I interviewed for the job at the New York Times, I had to say in every single meeting I had, you do realize it will take 18 to 24 months before you see anything because you, and part of that is you have to, I mean, you just in general, you just have to tell people things three times before they hear you, but then you need to keep repeating it. So like, for instance, we got a disability journalism fellowship created this year at the New York Times. You know, I keep reminding like my boss, you do remember that our very first conversation with the Ford Foundation was in December 19th of 2019, right? And our fellow started June of 2021. That was 18 months. Like I said, it would be when you interviewed me for the job. And then I also like to create visual timelines when I'm doing stakeholder updates of how long it's taken us to do past things, where we are relative to our first conversations to keep reminding people of that. And then I think the other thing is really setting expectations with your funders, right? Like 
um, I think we signed our contracts around our headway initiative with all our funders in November of 2020. Um, you know, our we didn't get an editor in of that editor hired until March on board starting the job until March of 2020. And then we got the rest of the team hired this summer. So that is a very long leeway that I feel like we, you know, our funders trust us. So that's good. But I think it's also setting the expectations with the funders. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really, that's really important. It's because it takes so long, 18 to 24 months to cultivate and bring people on board for the most part, not always, but for the most, most part, how do you guys manage that with your newsroom as an example, where um, the news is immediate, it's urgent, we're thinking about what's right in front of us to get out the door and online and posted and engaging with community and so forth. I mean, how do you balance that and get, get the newsroom and the organization to a place where they're, they're willing and able to think that far in advance for something that's not, you know, an immediate pressing need? Yeah, that, that was something I was just thinking of is if, with the expectations is also setting ex internal expectations with the teams that you're working with. I think that um, especially for so many of the people that we're working with and many of you are on the call who come from the journalism background and aren't as familiar with the fundraising background, the, the idea that we have to have so many months out before we can you know, close a gift and you know, the process of applying for a foundation can take, um, you know, that grant, a grant can take so long. And so there's two sides to that expectation. One is saying to the newsroom, it may take a while before I get this fully funded. Um, the other thing I've found is that I have to um, really work to encourage the newsroom to think ahead um, and plan ahead as much as possible and to bring me into the loop really early, even when something is just a glimmer in their eyes, you know, and it may not be fully formed as an idea. But the thing is, I'm talking with foundations and with individual donors all the time. And if I hear something that sounds like a cue, that is um, something that the newsroom is aspiring to, I can start, you know, marrying those ideas together. But if I don't know what the newsroom and the leadership of the organization is thinking about, even if it's long term, or as I said, not fully baked, there's no way I can pick up on those clues. And, um, you know, several years ago, I remember our audience chief had just mentioned to me in passing that she wanted to, um, start measuring some different you know, pieces about our audience. And not an hour later, I was on a phone with phone call with the foundation and they also mentioned their desire to sort of see that sort of measurement. And so, you know, I was able to say, great, that's fantastic. We wanna do that too, will you fund that? And they were willing to, and I would not have been able to even make that happen had you know, the audience chief not confided in me, brought me into the loop on what she wanted to do. And so I think part of it is giving those examples to the people that you're working with so that it becomes more, more concrete. I think that there's um, often, um, and this isn't isolated to journalism, that I've found that the program staff, almost everywhere I've worked, have been a little wary of the fundraising and it's mainly because they just don't understand it. So I think as much as we can do, to demystify the fundraising process, um, demonstrate sort of the, the, the art and the science of it. You know, we take a very sort of data-driven approach to our fundraising and there's no smoke and mirrors, there's no magic, you know, uh, <laughs> there's maybe a little bit of magic, but, um, but, you know, I think normalizing it and making it understandable um, helps everyone be more willing to participate in the process. And then when you celebrate those wins with everyone and say, they get the idea like, oh, you know, we were able to hire a women's health reporter because we gave the development team 12 months advance notice, you know, and they were able to, to um, raise all those funds to get this started. So when we start sort of having that positive feedback and, and reinforcement that, we're here just to make your dreams happen, you know, I guess in the most elevated way that, um, that suddenly people go from being wary to being, you know, like, 
coming in my office all the time and saying, hey, I have an idea, you know, and that's the dream for me. So when there's an 18 to 24 month cultivation of donors and funders, the same thing might be said of our colleagues internal. Frank Munging just threw in the, the chat, you know, this is a great example of the need for good internal communications between development, you know, and the newsroom. And it sort of goes both ways, doesn't it, guys? Because then once the gift is in, we have to keep the newsroom and the program folks up to speed on what the deliverables are and what the expected outcomes are and the reporting that we have to do back to funders. Do you find that um, that's easy, hard, gets easier as it goes, just part of the whole package of long-term cultivation to get everybody sort of engaged in the, in the whole process? Well, I'll add in before uh, that the other, the flip side of what I just talked about is that if we apply for something and it takes, then the newsroom is excited about, but it takes 12 months to find out, they have forgotten about it. Yeah. So the other thing I have to do is just to remind people about sort of what's in play um, and just, you know, a reminder, we've applied for, you know, this investigative project or this thing. And, you know, because when it, when we get the funding, it's real. You know, and so I think that it's, um, you know, reminding people also what we've applied for and the status and, you know, keeping it sort of top of mind just so they don't have it moved on. Pretty sure I know we're yeah, going to I'm sorry, go ahead, Sharon. Um, I mean, I think like oftentimes if you work in development um, in journalism, you, well, I mean, newsrooms are kind of disorganized places, right? <laughs> like, they're really good at what's going to happen this afternoon on the web and tomorrow in the print edition and what's happening Sunday. But beyond that, it's kind of like, eh. so you often end up having to play these project management roles. And I mean, we've been really lucky at the times, Nick Sweeter, who's also on this call as a project manager at the times. And we've had great project managers in the past at the Seattle times, but you know, you don't go into this thinking that you think your job is to go out there and raise money, but actually you end up doing a lot of project management because newsrooms aren't used to being on this very long one year or two year cycle of producing stuff on a timeline and getting reports done and tracking your how much you're spending. Yeah. Frazier, out of all of us, you've probably been at the helm of, you know, creating more startups and programs and fundraising from scratch um, than any of us, both at the Salt Lake Tribune, and then of course at the National Trust for Local News. How did you start thinking about both of those projects? Like how long did it take? It, probably two very different stories, but just a sense of how you started that process and how you started thinking about it and how long it took to you felt like it was really generating for those of us who are really building from the ground up. Well, I, I don't think, I don't think anything's ever really done. And I think that's one of the real stressors in our, in our jobs, right? And so it's important to, to give yourself some milestones so that, you know, just as Sharon and, and Terry have been talking about, the, the, the lag time between an idea and execution and seeing something come to fruition. And Terry, you're absolutely right. People forget that they even that they had that idea, you know, and then you're like, oh, look, we just got the approval from Frontline to do this documentary together. What? You know, remember you wanted that? And I've been, I've been over here working on it for the last year. Or so um, with the Tribune, you know, I think part of what was really exciting about that work was not only that it was the first newspaper to try to become a nonprofit, but it was um, a daily, you know, Metro newspaper, but it was also a real opportunity for our community to think about news in a new way. You know, they had been so used to having the newspaper show up on their door every day, you know, come rain or snow in Utah, and hadn't really thought about its, its importance in the, in the community's conversation. And some of the comments in chat have been the sense of, you know, indifference or how do you engage a family foundation? You know, part of it, people, people haven't necessarily thought about our work in the light of its importance across a lot of community issues. So both in building the, the Tribune's nonprofit um, and philanthropy space, but also in building the National Trust for Local News, the new organization I'm helping to start with two brilliant women, Elizabeth Hansen Shapiro and Lillian Ruiz. We're having to really think, help people think about news again and in a different way. And to do that, you really need a lot of 
other people who understand that and can speak to different constituencies. So when you when you start an or a fundraising campaign or start um, thinking about philanthropy with news, who are the people that can help spread that message for you? Because it's just you. You can't do it all. So sure, the board and leadership, but readers were incredibly important to the Salt Lake Tribune. When we first started talking to readers and did a lot of focus groups and surveys about what do you think about the Tribune? What do you think about the fact that we're considering becoming a nonprofit? We had to educate our home base first, and then they served as, as big ambassadors for us. It became kind of the buzz of the town. With the National Trust for Local News, we're trying to find um, the same, sorry, I live kind of at a high speed area if you hear motorcycles. Um, we're having to do the same thing of sort of building an understanding of why community weekly newspapers, the things that everybody thought were dead and not important, are as important, Sharon, as the New York Times in our mind. And I'm sure the New York Times believes that too. So how do you kind of create the conversation? It's not just us speaking, it's the reporters, it's the readers, it's other funders. Once you get a funder, they're likely to talk about the success of the work that you're doing with their peers. So those of you that commented about family foundations, Getting in with a good family foundation, you know, the good housekeeping seal of approval family foundation in your town, they are often um, related to all the other family foundations uh, and at least see them all the time. So getting, letting those people know that you need them to help you tell your story. And that's, again, the advice. Who else should we be talking to? What, what about our message isn't resonating? Do you understand what I'm saying? How can I say it differently? Who else, you know, all those nuances. I think that um, all of those things can be really helpful, not only in a startup, but in building a culture of philanthropy in your community for your cause. Um, and making sure that people think about the newspaper and the news organization that you're representing when they think about, as, as Terry pointed out, the environment social services. Oh, if we didn't have the Salt Lake Tribune, we wouldn't even know this was a problem, this was a problem, this was a problem. So I know that's a long-winded answer, but I think that plugging into all these networks and plugging your story in to those networks is really, really, really helpful to growing a startup or any other organization. It's, it's really interesting, Frazier. And the other day you said something um, to the effect of we as development professionals should feel like we're coming to the table as equals with our donors, whether they're foundation funders or individual donors. We're, we're offering donors an opportunity to participate in something really special and amazing and so important to our community um, or, our, or our communities. Um, yeah, I really learned that at the Community Foundation. You know, I have to say there was a brief shining moment in my life when I was giving away money. Mm -hmm. And that was... Uh, that was fun, and but it was harder than than you think. I mean, these folks are super busy. They don't know necessarily. They don't have time to do the research and figure out who's doing the best work. So you know, some of the things Sharon said is so critical here. When when you're offering someone a qualified opportunity to make uh, an investment that will make a real difference in their community, they're glad to hear about it. And it's important that you not just share the opportunities that you're offering, but as we did at the Community Foundation, the opportunities that exist in the community that are not yours. Mm -hmm. So if someone is really passionate about homelessness and they funded some reporting in that area or um, you know, things like that, let them know about the new initiatives happening around homelessness in your community. Let them know that there are other people and that you're, that shows that you're connected and knowledgeable about the community. And it shows that you care much more than just about your own narrow world, that you actually care about the, the change that you're trying to create. And you're offering them other opportunities that relate to their passion and relate to that change. And it puts you in a, in a I mean, you're not really a peer, but you're certainly equals when it comes to wanting to make good things happen in the world. And so being a vector for that is exciting. And it also helps a little bit with some of the rejection issues, because even if you don't get the money, 
your friend Sue is getting the money or Bob's getting the money and that feels good. It also helps offset the idea that you're somehow coming hat in hand or, or that there's something distasteful about fundraising. Um, when, when, when you just think of it about, you know, I think of it as a, an alignment of values, you know, and that when you're going, uh, when you're bringing this opportunity to someone that you know it's a great fit with their with their interests and their passions, it's it is a great feeling, and I think it can offset that feeling uh, or that hesitancy, um, especially when you're um, training, you know, uh, others who haven't worked in fundraising yet. Um, that you're you're bringing people opportunities to to do something that they care about um, passionately. And so to not think of it as something distasteful. Yeah, yeah I mean, you, I mean you one really might... have to, I'm sorry, just, you know, putting on a feminist point of view, you know, feminists, one of the precepts of feminism is power is expansive. The more I have does not mean that you have less, right? right? There is as much as we make possible. And so it's the same with fundraising. Do not think that your little slice of the pie is, you know, you're taking away from someone else. We are building a more just society. We share values with all of the organizations that we report on, that we fundraise with to create a world that works better for more people. And so that means that everything we do builds on that. And that means the relationships we have with donors are as important as the relationships we have with the organizations we we you know coalesce with around fundraising and the organizations we report on. It's all we're all in this together, and that makes the work much more heartfelt and much more positive. So those little rejections are less painful because you're really you realize that you know the arc of justice is a long bend, and we're all on that together. Could I just add a thing that I've really learned from Fraser? It is really this, I, I, I mean, I, her point about not thinking of your role solely as in asking for the gift or the grant and thinking of yourself as a connector is something that I've seen Fraser do over and over again. And she's a connector, you know, she might know someone, she might introduce you like, oh, I know you're not going to fund my thing because that's not your giving strategy but I know this other thing that might fit your giving strategy. And I feel like that is something that I've really learned from watching Frasier. And I think that's why she's effective at starting up all these things in lots of different spaces, right? From a community foundation to journalism in Salt Lake to now the National Trust. Um, I do want to go back to this idea of like, are we like that Terry kind of touched on this idea of like begging for money, right? I think like you're going to hear that when you're a fundraiser. And the stories we tell ourselves are really important. And so whenever someone says it to me, I just heard it from a friend of mine who's like runs a podcast and is doing like a campaign between the end of the year that he was begging for money. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no one here is begging for money. Like we come to the table as equals. Yeah. Like the donor comes with funding. The asker comes with this incredible opportunity that might fit what they're looking to enable. Like that donor cannot sit down and write a story about homelessness. That donor cannot sit down and like dish out soup to, for a hundred homeless people. That's what we're bringing. Yeah, I, I, I find that fundraising, working with donors, individual donors is one of the most special, almost intimate moments you can be a part of. You're working with somebody to connect them with something they believe in, to do more with their resources than they ever expected they might do, to drive change in their communities, change that's important to them, and they don't get anything in return except knowing that they're making a difference. And to be at the center of that relationship and that opportunity is a really, really special thing that not many industries have. I mean, I think development professionals are uniquely suited, you know, or, or, or it's a unique role to development professionals to have that kind of relationship with, with people. And we've been talking a lot about sort of individual donors. Can we talk about sort of the different types of giving? Like we've all heard about corporate sponsorships. We've seen them. Do we raise them? I don't know. Do we love them? Do we hate them? Big national foundations. Everybody wants the Knight Foundation or the Arnold Foundation, you know, all of these big funders, and I'm sure 
Sharon in Seattle, you heard people say, well, our work is really good and Bill Gates is really rich. So can we just ask for money? You know, it's a, it's a whole process and a whole, a whole body of work. How do you, I mean, what do you think about sort of all of us going after sort of the big national dollars versus the local donor who's more connected to the work we're doing? Is it an, a yes and one or the other? What do you guys think? I'll, I'll just say that at the Seattle Times, at the time I left, um, and I know Kristen Dizon is on from the Seattle Times and she would have the more updated numbers. Like we had raised at that point, $4 million, only 200 of that thousand of that came from a foundation that was based outside of Seattle. Um, so your local funders is where it's at, right? That is where all the opportunity is. I will even say at the New York Times, I feel like to some extent our fundraising is local because you know, the, the foundations that are based in New York are actually more likely to talk to us than the foundations that are outside of New York, which is strange to think about, right? But I actually still think the same thing is true. Michael Fitzgerald actually put something in the chat, um, mostly for you saying when you work for a named institution like New York Times or the Seattle Times, does it cause any problems with funders in, in trying to raise money? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, like our brands bring baggage, right? And they have reputations, um, you know, uh, I mean, the New York Times, you know, does amazing journalism. It's also seen as an elitist institution in journalism circles. People may be worried that it's like um, getting so large that it's a winner take all situation, which I personally don't believe in having worked at a local event. And I also think that so I think there's two things. One is like from the funder who is um, thinking about journalism being a named institution, both you're bringing on the positive attributes of your brand as well as the negative also. I can't really convince the people that are never going to get on board. I can let them know what we're doing. I think that's part of my job so that they know and they don't have, they aren't making up their own narrative about what we're doing in the absence of information, but I'm never going to fully convince them. And that's okay. I mean, we can still have a relationship and a connection um, where I'm keeping them in the loop. Um, I think there's the other thing, this, re this idea out there that the New York Times is going to come in and take all the money and there's not gonna be any money left for other nonprofits or other local journalism papers in the philanthropic world. Um, I've, I, you know, I know that's a concern. That was a concern of mine as well coming into this role, but I really went back to what Fraser said in that power is expansive and that a rising boat, a rising tide lifts all boats. I yeah, saw I that at the Seattle Times mm -hmm. when we raised money for journalism that actually allowed the PBS affiliate to go out and identify other funders that they could reach out to. And I know Crosscut was able to raise a tremendous amount of money to like increase their newsroom by many positions by going to the same funders that the Seattle Times did, which I totally applaud, right? We And I feel good about that. We educated some funders about the importance of journalism and they decided to spend more money on it. That's really, really exciting and absolutely true what about Andy, go ahead i was just going to say I'll, i just want to add in that you know we've seen this a lot um the, the the importance of local funding i cannot emphasize enough you know um we saw it this summer you know the tribune's revenue lab and linfest partnered um on some some workshops and everybody wants the silver bullet they want to understand how they can get that big national foundation to support them and um, the, the, the success of the Tribune, we have been lucky to have a, um, some national grants, but the, the core of our sustainability and how we've made it to this 12 year mark has been through local funders and mm -hmm. um, whether they're foundations or uh, individuals. And so I, I, I know that temptation that everybody really wants this sort of, you know, someone to fly in and, you know, uh, pour a pile of money on top of them from a national um, funder, but really that the time you spend on a local on, on your relationships with local entities and getting them there is so much more important. Um, and also, you know, uh, big national foundations pivot, they pivot their priorities, they pivot on their, um, you know, what they're thinking about next and their staff and, you know, your local foundations, their priorities are going to stay 
fairly consistent, you know, and, you know, when I'm working with Texas foundations, they're not going to change their priority from Texas. And so um, it's well worth that time and energy. And, um, you know, I know that that's uh, everyone and including your board and your your CEOs and all of that want to see that big gift from night um, and all of that. But um, I just can't emphasize enough how much local is the key to success. Well, and that, that, holds, true for, that holds true for sponsorships too. Somebody Absolutely. asked a question about how do you start to build sponsorship relationships for your journalism projects? And that's an important revenue stream for you guys at the Texas Tribune, Terry, isn't it? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that local focus and how much we should lean on our corporate community for philanthropy? Right, you know, um, we, through our um, site sponsorships and through our event sponsorships um, can range somewhere between 20 to 30% of our annual revenue comes from corporate um, support. And a lot of that is that we treat the businesses that we work with, just like we've been discussing how we would treat individuals and foundations. We don't think of it as transactional. We cultivate those relationships. We know what they're interested in. And when we know that, that you know, um, XYZ uh, Corporation is really interested in education and we find out that we're doing an education um, symposium, we're already teed up in those relationships so that they're not cold calls. And so that, and, and we have, we were able to almost enjoy a, um, a renewal cycle, look just like you would see with a grant to a certain extent, because we've developed these relationships. Also our remarkable sponsorship lead, our, our revenue chief, April uh, Heathel, does very much what, what Fraser um, described, which she's always thinking about being a connector. And so she will connect if she finds out that one business that we're working with is really interested in foster care and meets someone else who's also interested in that, she'll take the time to introduce them when that has nothing to do with the success of her program. But she is treating these um, businesses you know, as people um, and as individuals and cultivating them. Um, so, because she knows that it's not only the, the right thing to do, but it's the right business thing to do. And it pays off down, down the line. Annie, we had a question about reaching community foundations. And I know, uh -huh. Terry, you, you've had a lot of success there. And this person was writing that they're a little frustrated that they're having a hard time kind of getting in. One thing I might suggest is, you know, community foundations have board of directors that are local folks. And it may be that one of those board members is associated with your organization as a reader, or as a donor, you know, ask, um, for a meeting and just, again, ask for advice, not for money and say, you know, this is what we're up to. This is, you know, the kinds of support we've been getting from the community. We'd like to expand that support. We think the community foundation and, and the donor advisors that are affiliated with the foundation, you know, might be interested. What's a, you know, what advice do you have about how we can um, start to tell our story to those donors? And Try and find an in that way, if not directly through the executive director, but through another board member or through, look at the list of donor advisors. Many community foundations list all their advisors. Look at that list and see if one of those folks is um, already uh, participating in, in your uh, fundraising efforts. And just, just poke around, just don't go in guns a blazing for money. Poke around well, and ask for, insights and input and what's the right way and what's the best way and what advice do they have and soon you'll find that you you know crack open that door a little bit and you know good things no, can happen and you know that's so true because like this year we've received two gifts one from an individual and one from a foundation that we have asked every year for four years and but we haven't given up and, but we've also, not, that's about not taking no personally, right? Yeah. Well, I always say, unless they take out a restraining order, I'm <laughs> going to continue to ask. But what we also didn't do was we didn't drop them. You know, we continued to, you know, respectfully, but, you know, invite people, invite these folks to things we were doing or send articles that we knew were interest of interest. And so um, I don't want to say I wore them down. I think what I did was I, they finally got the case for the value 
that um, that the Tribune um, brings, and that it is was aligned and is aligned with with what they were aspiring to. And so, you know, I just think it's you know you've got to think about that long term gain. You know, uh, the or the you know it's a marathon. Um, and and again, we started off talking about expectations. That can be very hard when you're working with a leadership that wants things, you know, now, right now, now. They think it's a silver bullet and they want answers right away. I know ever since I started here, Jim's mantra to me has always been, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. Relax a little bit, take a breath. When we were launching the fundraising programs for Spotlight PA, uh, the editor-in-chief, Chris Baxter, and his development director, um, Joanna Bernstein, reached out to community foundations across the state and asked them to host sort of mini town halls or convenings so that they could hear about the concerns and issues of business leaders, philanthropic leaders, regular citizens, community members um, that Spotlight PA might try to address in some of its reporting, certainly keeping the separation between church and state, but really trying to engage community and using the community foundations to help host those. And for the most part, they were very agreeable um, to doing that. And, and Spotlight learned a lot about you know, the state and its issues. And Joanna learned a lot about funding opportunities and people who might be interested in each community. And it just sort of, it, you know, it evolved from, from there. Spotlight PA, when we launched, I don't think Pennsylvania community foundations across the state had really ever partnered together on a project, one project. And because the reporting out of Harrisburg influences and affects every community across our state. They were willing, after talking with them a while and showing them what the plan was and what the vision was, willing to throw in a little bit of money because they knew the benefit would come back to their community about being more informed about what's happening in Harrisburg. So um, again, it's even if you're working statewide, you know, it's finding that local, that local flavor or connection that, that makes what we're doing relevant to your neighbor, really, I guess. Um, I'll also just add that, um, so Seattle Foundation, the Community Foundation became a really important partner of the Seattle Times. And it wasn't through funding, it was simply that they were willing to be a fiscal sponsor and serve as a nonprofit that was receiving the funds and the Seattle Times was a contractor to that. I'll also mention that Kristen Dizon, who now works at the Seattle Times, used to work at the Seattle Foundation. She's on this call if you want to message her. I'm just volunteering her as a resource. But I mean, I, I will say the conversation with Seattle Foundation took longer than conversations with funders. Like it was more than two years for us to like, and it, the first few meetings were really like, meet and greets, which are really important. And then we just kept saying the same thing. This is what we want to do. The concept did not really exist out there yeah. at the time that we were starting to talk about it. So it was even harder then. You just have to keep telling that story over and over again. I think eventually also like then they're also just because they're not funding something doesn't mean they don't want to do it. It might be they're waiting to see where their strategy lands. It could be what you're talking about may inform their strategy and lead to something. So yeah. I, I mean, it's people talk about it being a marathon. Um, I don't like that because I don't like to run or jog. Um, <laughs> okay. One of my life's goals is to never do a marathon. Um, but I think about it as gardening. And that yeah. was one of Frank Blethyn's metaphors. And he's like, all we're doing is we're tilling the ground, we're mo removing the rocks, we're planting seeds, and we're watering and we're weeding. We actually don't know what's going to grow. But if we don't do the work, nothing's going to grow. I love that. And you know, the other thing I think about with community foundations or with others is some, some of them can't give you money for, for various reasons of the way they're formed. You know, um, we like, Evan Smith here likes to say, if you've met one foundation, you've met one foundation. They all have different parameters. <laughs> and so we've also talked to, to them about things like, you know, ho uh, hosting us for something, you know, be, you know, you can be an, ad community foundations are very influential in their communities. Their, their, their advocacy is, is, um, is a great, you know, good housekeeping seal of approval. And so we've often just said, you know, would you host something for us? And by you hosting, our education summit, um, you know, you are uh, endorsing what we do, and you know what we've also had success with um, with these foundations is, you know, to say, and they've even said to me, you know, they're not going to stop. We're not competing with their direct service grants. 
Um, we're not taking money away from all those things, but what we're doing is raising awareness for these things that they already care about dramatically. And as one foundation in Texas said to me is, you know, we're just, we feel like every year we're just plugging the cracks, you know, the, there's the cracks in the wall and we're just plugging them. But what we also need to work on is, is system, you know, systems change. And we feel like your reporting raises awareness that will eventually get to systems change. And so that's, you know, that raising awareness piece is, is where I feel like we've found the greatest success in talking to non-traditional journalism funders, um, both individuals um, and uh, entities is that we're aligned and that we're trying to raise awareness for this other thing that you care about so much. Yeah, and, and so much of this is about setting expectations, isn't it, yeah. with funders? And Bob Woodward asked earlier in the in the chat, you know, how do you think about setting expectations for funders? Jessica Clark just threw in it's, you know, part of fundraising is evidence-driven storytelling, right? Uh, the right. evaluation, you know, those skills are complementary. Can you guys talk a little bit about sort of how do you measure success and how do you set expectations for funders that success is achievable and that you're marching towards it. It's certainly not just about the amount of money that we raise. Um, how, do you, how do you think about that? Well, one, you know, one thing is that certainly a lot of our fundraising is, is gifts from individuals without an expectation of reporting. Uh, but there's a whole nother side of our work, which, you know, we've seen some comments in the chat about data and data points. And Sharon talked about being project managers. In many respects, our job is to be the one that shows the impact and to be mindful all the time that there's reporting required. And we've got to go back and tell people not how we spent the money, but what, what the result was of the gift that they gave. And sometimes that's set out in the grant contract, but sometimes it's pretty you know, vague. And so one of the really critical parts of our job is being that data collector, that story collector, that tracker of impact and keeping all that organized um, as long as well as you know, tracking all the conversations you have. And, and so this can be a pretty nerdy job. It's not just, you know, going out to lunch with rich people. I mean, it's like you're down in the details. Measuring impact is something that I'm really excited about because I used to work at the Sorensen Impact Center and we spent a lot of time on, on impact metrics. One of the challenges in our, in our world is so much of the, the storytelling has been about what goes wrong when news goes away. You know, we've, we've all seen that data, you know, partisanship and voting goes down and blah, blah, blah. We need to start being better at telling the story about the good things that happen because we exist. Now we can't be causative. You know, the Tribune, um, Texas Tribune did a story about homelessness and boom, homelessness disappeared. I mean, it's not, it, you know, it's not a scientific corollary, but as you said, Terry, how, what changes are we seeing because of increased awareness? What, um, what can we say about the number, not just the number of people reading stories and their engagement, but have we seen any changes in legislation? Have we seen an increase in giving to, to the issues that your journalism raised awareness of? That's where knowing your friends in the fundraising world and those other areas is really important because if you wanna say, hey, we did a whole series about early childhood education and boom, in comes the Gates Foundation with a big initiative. You know, keeping track of that sort of global story of your community and what's happening in the community in areas where you've been engaged, I think is an important part of measuring success. But it means, it means keeping track of a lot of things. And it also means not lying. So you can't say we did a story and the world changed dramatically, but you can say our attention to this was part of a narrative in the community that's resulting in X. Yeah, I'm a big believer. I, I say that the back of house is just as important as the front of house. There's a and lot. And telling the that. truth is and really- And it is kind of a nerdy thing. I mean, there's a lot to track. There's a lot to, 
be on top of the reporting back to donors, the stewarding of the gifts, all the way down to the processing of the gifts and getting them into your database. It seems like it's not worth it when you want to go out and get a big gift from somebody and all the work that that takes. But at the end of the day, if you don't do all that sort of really important infrastructure and stewardship stuff, a donor who gives you $500 today isn't going to come back if if you're not good at all, it's like a restaurant, right? <laughs> the kitchen and the wait staff have to work in great harmony together uh, in order to get customers to keep coming back, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't have the tools and you don't have those skills, you know, trying to find help on your staff or interns or other things that can help set up those databases for you so you can track things, um, you know, is great. And you know, Impact Architects has some, done some really wonderful work around measuring impact. So take a look at Lindsay, Lindsay's work and others. It's all open source. People are so generous in our space. Um, yeah. Please take a look and see how you might be able to tap into some of that. We have a question from um, Shift Press. I know we have some sessions on this topic moving forward in the summit, but um, they're wondering sort of what structural changes have you seen in your space to affect the issue around funding going to black communities, black news organizations through black fundraisers. Have you had, have you seen any changes there that you can talk about? I mean, I would say two things that I've seen that are super exciting. One is the race equity and journalism fund that was created at the at Borealis Philanthropy. And that is really a fund that, and I've been really heartened to see national funding go towards that organization because it's all about supporting um, journalists of color who are producing journalism to serve communities of color. So I think that's a really promising thing. I know Tracy Powell is launching something called the Pivotal Fund that is about supporting, I, I don't wanna misspeak, because, but I think one of the earlier ideas was supporting legacy black owned publications. Um, so I would say those are two really important structural things that I've seen. Could there be more? Yes. <laughs> I would love to see the national funders specifically allocate and designate like a portion of their annual funding towards under like journalism nonprofit initiatives run by underrepresented minorities. And obviously like having come out of the Asian American Journalists Association as a volunteer, that's where I raised money for the scholarship. It's where I served as a board president too. I, you know, I feel like there should definitely be more funding going towards that. There's a great organization. I don't know how long it's been around. I'm part of their allyship program called Women of Color in Fundraising and Philanthropy, which I it's either based out of New York or out of Washington, DC. So if there are um, development professionals, women of color, I, I urge you to look up that um, association because it will also, you know, all of these groups can help us build our networks and feel like <coughs> we're not so, not so quite alone. Um, I think uh, the Word in Black program at LMA is also um, yeah. an effort that is really going to have tremendous um, benefit. And then uh, the City University of New York Center for Community Media is another organization that's attracted good funding and has a lot to add to the space. But 100%, Sharon, everything we can do to increase the funding going to um, Black-owned papers, Black-owned media generally, and Black journalists, and the talent pipeline for those legacy Black papers and those legacy um, papers in the in the Latino community and in the Asian community, we've got to be supportive of the journalism programs at HBCUs and others so that we can really build a pipeline of, of uh, professionals, including in the fundraising space um, that are representative of the communities they serve. Yeah. A lot more also, work to be done here. Yeah, I mean, I also, when I said a rising tide lifts all boats, like, I mean, I think that's not just theoretical, like the Seattle Times raises this money and then another nonprofit can raise that money. A lot of our, the New York Times work was about, you know, initiatives that build a stronger society um, and a more just world funded by philanthropy in partnership with nonprofits. So we're always act actually over the past years, we've been working on building partnerships with nonprofits and helping lift them up through partnerships with the New York Times. So our Disability Journalism Fellowship was a partnership with the National Center on Disability and Journalism. 
Um, and we thought that was an important organization to uplift. We've been in conversations with black owned publications about partnerships. We've been in conversations with um, the journalists of color organizations about partnerships. They haven't been funded, but I, I do think that's an important part role for organizations that may already have somewhat of a track record to be thinking about in their vision for the future of their work. That's sure, that's certainly a focus of the National Trust for Local News. Try and make sure that these papers are sustainable and locally owned and remain in the community, um, deeply community embedded. Well, I wanna be mindful of the time um, uh, and just ask each of you if you have any uh, final words of wisdom for our session today. I'm happy to go first. Okay. I think it's really important to remember that all we really have in these roles as fundraisers is our integrity. We have to be, and I know we are, but we need to keep in mind always to be impeccably honest mm -hmm. about what we do, how we do it. We are, um, you know, one, one bad <laughs> decision, one miss, you know, one exaggeration about our impact, all of that kind of stuff. It really does go away. These, these are very, someone said in the chat, um, with relations to foundations, these are very personal relations, relationships, and you take them with you. So the Rolodex that Terry built at the Nature Conservancy went with her to the Texas Tribune. Um, you know, my years of fundraising in Utah go with me everywhere I go. And my friends say, oh, what's Fraser's latest Ponzi scheme, you know, jokingly. But if they think that what you do is valuable and the way you do it has integrity, the donors that you work with will be interested in and supportive of the causes that you connect them with and your career and you personally. So it's really important, really, really important to keep um, integrity front and center. Yeah, you know, we sort of say the same thing, Evan and I, you know, that you can always, you can get more money, but you can't get more integrity. And um, so, I think a lot of that too is just um, the whole idea of this group when Andy and I were standing in line at security at the Miami airport was that, that we could use this, this group and this forum to share best practices. And um, so I just, I wanna encourage everyone to really use this network um, and to reach out to each other for help um, you know, that's why the Tribune created our Rev Lab is for this very reason as well, because, you know, if you've got a doubt, you know, and you want to talk it through, um, there, it, you know, fundraising can feel lonely sometimes, especially if you're a one person team. Um, and so, you know, use, I want us to think of each other as lift, you know, we, have talked a lot about lifting um, all boats. And I really do think that's sincere and that um, we all should be, you know, helping each other, um, brainstorming together, helping troubleshoot, you know, ideas. And um, because we do want to maintain and, um, and you know, even elevate how um, philanthropy for journalism is viewed. Um, that's our long-term goal and the legacy that we can leave for the whole um, ecosystem, not just for our own individual orgs. Yeah, my message has to, I, I think has to do with um, discouragement and because this work takes a long time. And so like two years is a long time to be hoping <laughs> for something. But I will, so I'll just say the story that I think of a lot when I'm in that position, which is that um, when I, the first year I was doing this at the Seattle Times, um, we had gotten a small grant around, like this is about eight months into the job. We had gotten like a $20,000 grant from a foundation to fund a youth homeless series in our opinion section. Um, and it, you know, it was like a small early win and I was sharing it with the head of comms and public relations at the Seattle Times and just a regular check-in. And she was like, and I was like, uh, it's like $20,000. It's not enough to hire someone. We're gonna hire freelancers to backfill the writer working on it. And she was like, Sharon, this is alchemy. Like 
nothing existed there before. And now it does exist. There was no money there. Now there is going to be money. These, these yeah. stories didn't exist before. Now they are going to exist. So what you do is magic. And just hold that thought in your head when you're feeling discouraged. Totally agree with the three of you on all the points you brought up. I think I would only add to them to say, don't get discouraged, lead with integrity, communicate all the time, don't give up. And remember, remember that the work you're doing is so critically important to your organization and to your community, but also to the donors that you're connecting with and giving the opportunity to participate in something in a way they might never have imagined and to make change in a way they might never have imagined. It's a beautiful time. Doesn't always help when you're banging your head against the wall, putting that last gift into your database and making sure the thank you letter goes out. But if we keep those on a piece of paper on our wall, it'll help us remember and, and keep us going. Thank you so much, Frazier, Sharon and Terry for a really uh, wonderful opening session to the summit, three days of learning from our peers and other experts in the field. Uh, we have lots of topics uh, and conversations ahead. I hope you all will check out the full schedule for the, for the full three days. So many of the questions that we've started to address or maybe didn't even get a chance to address in this session, um, we'll dive into more deeply over the course of the next couple of days. I hope you'll come back uh, at one o'clock Eastern time for our next sessions. We have three of them happening. One is uh, titled, Is There a New Normal in Philanthropy? Looking at Current and Emerging Trends in Philanthropy led by Rashonda Mahone from the Inclusion Firm. We have a session, a workshop on an introduction to grant writing for news organizations led by Molly Penn and her team at Penn Creative Strategy. And then a community chat where we can let our hair down and it's totally off the record on dealing with burnout with Roxanne Stafford of the Knight Lenfest Local News Transformation Fund. So hopefully those will all be interesting and inspiring and helpful to us all. At 2.30 this afternoon, Jim Friedlich, the Lenfest Institute's Executive Director and CEO uh, is hosting a fireside chat with Stuart Bainham, business person, philanthropist, and chairman of the Venetulis Institute about his work in Baltimore, negotiating with Alden and launching the Baltimore banner. So we hope you'll join us for that as well. So we emailed you the Zoom links for all the sessions this morning. Please take advantage of everything the summit has to offer and we'll see you soon and often. Thank you. Thank you.